Hey everybody, it's Timothy here again, and we're getting ready to go live on Twitch for the Queen Elizabeth Piano Competition final round. Super exciting, I know. Each night we're going to be joined by a past laureate of the competition to have discussions and conversations starting Monday with Remy Janier, Tuesday with Takashi Sato, Wednesday with Mariangelo Vacatello and Christine Lee, Thursday with my own brother Nikki Chewy, Friday with Henry Kramer, and Saturday with David Fung. We're also going to have exclusive interviews with the finalists themselves right off the stage, so make sure you don't miss that. Also going to have special guests, inspiring guests such as Marin Aslov join us in conversation. So make sure you join us and follow us on the Twitch channel and you won't miss a beat. I'll see you there. Hey everybody, it's Timothy here again and we're getting ready to go live on Twitch for the Queen Elizabeth Piano Competition final round. Super exciting, I know. Each night we're going to be joined by a past laureate of the competition to have discussions and conversations starting Monday with Remy Janier, Tuesday with Takashi Sato, Wednesday with Mariangelo Vacatello and Christine Lee, Thursday with my own brother Nikki Chewy, Friday with Henry Kramer and Saturday with David Fung. We're also going to have exclusive interviews with the finalists themselves right off the stage, so make sure you don't miss that. Also going to have special guests, inspiring guests such as Marin Aslov join us in conversation. So make sure you join us and follow us on the Twitch channel and you won't miss a beat. I'll see you there. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's so nice to see all of you here again. Thank you for joining in for the Queen Elizabeth Piano Competition live on Twitch this year. It's super exciting. First time for us to do this, and I think one of the first ever for a competition of a major competition to do this via Twitch. I'm Timothy Chewy. Thank you so much for joining in again, as I mentioned before. I was the second prize winner of the 2019 violin competition. And it's so great to connect with so many of you over the past couple of days through the Twitch chat. For those of you that are just joining us in for the first time and all those who are returning, please, you know what to do. Type in the chat box where you guys are all tuning in from. I'm in Montreal, Canada right now. 
We'd love to know where you're all tuning in from, and that is going to be so fun. I'll call you out. If any of you are from Canada, shout out already. So tonight, we're going to have a really special guest. We have Henry Kramer, who is the second prize winner of the 2016 piano competition, and also a very close friend of mine. Thank you for being with us tonight, and we'll be back with you in a couple of minutes. Later on, we're also going to receive um, uh, a nice invitation from uh, a nice uh, appearance, sorry, from Ian Bernstein, Scottish classical pianist, a former presenter on BBC Radio 3. He's been a part of the Queen Elizabeth competition jury since 2014 for the voice edition and 2016 for the piano edition. All right, so let's see, where are people joining in from? Okay, still in Amsterdam, Jeremy Khan. <laughs> All right, Julie Jew from Belgium. Nice, awesome. Is that it? Come on, we got more people. We gotta get the likes up. Hello from Canada. Awesome. Well, Henry's joining us from the US and he'll tell us more about that in a little bit. More from Brussels, Belgium. That's awesome. Brussels, he he he. This is such a strong, loyal fan. Awesome. Hello from LA. Oh, we have someone from LA. That's awesome. Great. So Queen Elizabeth competition. For those of you who don't know it, it's a major international competition for vote for many instruments and it alternates every single year. It was violin, there's piano, there's voice, and recently cello. Last year, we, we did not have a competition because of COVID and that was just such a shame to lose one year, but we're having this this year. And even though it's not quite as it should be because the public and the audience does play such a big role in making sure that we have a successful event, we're doing this twist stream now and it's going to be awesome. We have great guests on here. It's been great so far. Let me know who your favorite guest has been so far. Okay, we've got some from Gouda, from one from Ontario, from Delft. I don't know where that is. Yeah, this competition is a major one for young artists. It really just launches them into an international career. I know my life has changed since I, I took part in that competition. It was completely different. And suddenly it was like a dream come true. And we're gonna talk about that with Henry today as well. Next year, we're gonna have the cello edition, then go back to singing and then violin. Uh, tonight, we're gonna be talking about the previous participants over the past couple of nights, tonight's contestant as well, which we'll get to in a bit, talking about the jury. We have an international jury, a really fantastic one. Really, really, really incredible to have these people all together in one room. So if you have any questions, as always, feel free to put them in the chat box. Henry and I will be answering them tonight as much as we can. So let's just have fun, talk about music, relax, chill, and nerd out. Henry, welcome to the Twitch stream. Thank you for joining us tonight. Really good to have you. You and I have been talking, it's amazing. Where are you calling us from? Hey, Timmy, I'm in Georgia, in America. Ah, oh, it's really nice weather there, I bet. Can you introduce a little bit about no, yourself to the audience who is seeing you for the first time and kind of just remind us a little bit of your performance in 2016. How did it feel? Uh, where are you now? And, and uh, just tell us, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I... Um was, as I think you mentioned, the second prize winner in the last piano competition, um, which was in 2016. And now I am based in Georgia, half in Georgia and half in New York City. Um, I teach at the Schwab School of Music in Columbus, Georgia. And actually one of my students, Alexei Trusheshkin, was in the first round of this year's Queen Elizabeth competition. and uh i yeah i teach and i play concerts and you know you know that for sure we talk all the time yeah. So. <laughs> yeah yeah it's so nice to have you on here so let's play a clip of henry from the 2016 competition i actually remember seeing some of this uh, in real time so serious look at you <laughs> so sweaty. i was so sweaty <laughs> OK, 
his finger close up. This is a really close up, close up. <laughs> You can see I'm drenched in sweat. It was so hot on the stage. Yeah, it's always been so hot in my experience. I remember like my brother, when he played last time, he had to take off his jacket because it was just way too hot. I didn't even bother to wear one because I didn't think I'd be able to play this concerto with it on. Right. Oh, I love this piece. Look at you go. Good memory. Bravo. Oh my God, you want to hug me. You want to hug me because I'm, I'm so wet. <laughs> Yeah. Welcome, welcome I, everyone I, I that's joining us in. That was awesome. Wow, what an exciting part of the piece. Do you, okay, tell us, do you remember that last push through, how much adrenaline was going through your body and just through your blood system at that point? I mean, I don't, I just remember feeling like um, absolute, absolutely free at the keyboard. It was pretty great. You know, and um, you know what you can see in that video is how close the audience is to you, actually. That's one of the things I didn't realize about Bozar before playing there was that anytime you like looked down at your right hand, you saw somebody's face like almost right below you. So it was, um, I don't know, it was, it was a great experience. And Marin yeah. also up and the conductor she's amazing and yeah but it was i just remember um at that point after the week in the chapelle i just didn't really feel nervous or anything i was just really excited to be on stage yeah it's an incredible experience to be in that chapelle and we're going to talk a little bit more about that later on after dimitri goes on so the piano competition, as you mentioned, and even just this entire setting of the stage, it's you don't realize how close the audience members actually are. You can actually see them unwrapping candy and and just coughing or moving around. It's kind of it, if you're not used to it, it can be very disturbing. This year, we do not have any of that. I mean, do you think that's yeah? What are your first reactions of just doing everything online? Do you think that's more difficult now, or is it easier because you don't have that just distraction? Uh, I think it must be more difficult because I remember the Belgian audience had the, the energy and commitment and excitement made kind of helped me through the whole competition. Like I remember in the first time just feeling like, you know, the attention of the audience just made me keep trying for every note. So I actually, when I've been watching the, the, the little that I've been able to tune into this competition, I'm really in admiration of these competitors and, and musicians for giving such committed performances and you know in the absence it, they're playing for only a jury i mean that's horrible that's actually like worse, <laughs> like terrible situation. <laughs> yeah. so um i think you know i just tip my hat to all of them i think they've been incredible and also i tip my hat to the organization to the competition for making these like beautiful videos that we can all watch and for continuing to to do the competition despite despite the circumstances exactly it's a huge accomplishment to get this through during a very difficult time so let's get to know yeah. our finalist for tonight it's dimitri sin he's a russian pianist he's 24 years old very young and he began learning the piano at age six moved to moscow at age 13 and then studied at the Gnesin state musical college let's watch a little video that he recorded when he was at the chapelle hi 
Hi everyone, my name is Dmitry Sin. I'm 26 years old and I'm from Russia. And I'm one of the six finalists of Queen Elizabeth Piano Competition this year. because Rachmaninoff is my favorite composer and this piece is very close to me and very touching and I, I love to play it. Tom and Jerry. It was in my music school when just first lesson and I played like this. It was my first piece. <laughs> the most difficult music for me is modern music. It takes a lot of time to understand it. For example, you can play it like that. And you need to practice and like something like that. And yeah, it's, it's difficult. <laughs> I played one piece. It was composer piece for, for other competition. It, it was like that. Sometimes I play etudes before going on stage. Usually I have cold hands and when I play it, this, I have hot hands, it's very good. Let's say some Christmas song maybe. Usually I practice uh, six, seven hours per day, but it takes whole day. I practice almost all time and I don't have time for listen something else. You will do it like, you know, what is favorite your piece of music and I will play it. <laughs> always fun to get to know the competitor. And I think actually, Henry, we have a clip of you that you were playing the Titanic and that turned into Chopin. You remember this? <laughs> I forgot, but now I remember. <laughs> this was the first piece that I ever played on piano. <laughs> really? Yep. Yeah. I'm in, I'm in Montreal right now. This is where Celine Dion is from, right? Yeah. And this is the Chopin version. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that will be. Send fire emojis for this. <laughs> And that, that's pretty impressive right there. Yeah. I mean, so you said you oh, learned like, the, that was your first piece that you ever learned was the uh, Titanic theme. Yeah, that's how I came to the piano because um, I saw the movie and then I came home and I was playing it by ear. And then that's when my parents were like, you should take lessons, so. Do you have perfect pitch? No, I have oh, that's relative pitch. I might have perfect pitch, but it's a half step off because my first piano was so out of tune. 
<laughs> so my sense uh, of pitch is completely flat. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I find that so many pianists have perfect pitch. I mean, for violinists, uh, it's, it's so ironic. Uh, we had a question about this yesterday. Uh, you know, do most musicians at that level have perfect pitch? What do you think, Henry, from your experience? Um, I think a lot of people do. And I think I probably could accurately identify pitches, but my sense of like, you know, matching it to the Hertz is not like a violinist, for instance, I think, you know, because you guys think about intonation all the time. I think I'm listening more for the way tones resonate within a harmonic framework, mm -hmm. you know? Interesting, yeah, uh, perfect, it does make sense. Perfect pitch is one of those things that some people say you're born with. It's the, the ability to identify a pitch and name the note of it or to even replay it on a piano, violin, or whatever. For me, it's I can do that if it's within the register of the violin, but if it goes beyond that G, I'm lost. It just sounds like noise at that point for you, me. So your perfect pitch is within the violin tessitura or range. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And on the and then through the violin so like, timbre as well. What about like what about like It's weird. So I think that's a do, do, F sharp? No, it's E. <laughs> Maybe I don't. This is very embarrassing, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to play you on the Maybe I don't. Wait, wait, wait. If you play on the violin. What about like, well, I can't play. Wait, I have a violin here, but no bow. OK, here we go. Here, I'll try something here. F sharp. Good. So, okay. So you have perfect pitch, but it's violin specific. Any other yeah, instrument? Specific. You can't... Yeah, it's, it's, it's very, very niche. That's just so like funny. My, just like my, my skills. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm very embarrassed now. I'm turning oh my away because I uh, that. did that. But, but okay, let's talk about the program. No, you, thought, so no, every... you did well. You did well. You did... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Right, so dream members are coming now. Do, Henry, do you know any of these? Personally, we have Sh well, uh, Shai Balsner here. Shai. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the jury seems different. Oh, I know it, Ma um, Mari Kodama. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, she was on the jury of the Montreal competition when I did it in 2011. And I saw her in La Jolla. She played mm -hmm. there. and. And we're Instagram friends, so she's really <laughs> lovely. I don't know. If you guys know, are on Instagram but I don't with us Henry yet, make sure you follow Henry. Follow Henry on Instagram. Follow us on Instagram. That's the best way to, to be close to us, you know? <laughs> and let's just talk a little yeah. bit about the program before they go on stage. So he's going to be playing the imposed piece again, which is Jardin um, Ferric, and then Rachmaninoff third concerto as uh, yesterday by Sergei, the same piece, back to back. We have the queen coming out here. Every day she wears a different mask. Yesterday she wore, I think it was a green mask. It was a beautiful mask. Oh, she's got a, what is this color? Sand color? Oh, beige? Taupe? Beige, I was. Would you call that taupe? taupe? Ooh, I like that. Yeah, you know, you're expanding my vocabulary of colors. <laughs> <laughs> That's Stephanie. There's Stephanie. Corten, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, she's introducing us right now. So we've heard this imposed piece now three times, four times in a row. And every single time it's been a different experience. You know, did you get a chance to, to listen to this imposed piece yet? Yes, I saw Ke Kego. Mm -hmm. I think he played last yesterday. I saw him play it. Yeah, yeah. I thought he played it really well. He's like really yeah. ac really accurate, it seems like, and he really understood the orchestration. Definitely. I mean, the first three days, I would say that they had a relatively similar approach to the way they were playing. It was very ethereal. And one of them even said it was to them, they approached it like an impressionistic French piece. But yesterday with Sergei, he played it very percussively and it was a completely different interpretation. So I'm curious to know how much of your background of learning repertoire influences the, the new piece. We have a few questions here already. 
And oh, someone's oh, sorry, it was a purple mask yesterday, not not a green one. I think I'm getting my days all mixed up. I'm sorry. <laughs> someone said that someone said that they were actually at your performance. Val Classical was at your final round performance uh, in 2016. Isn't that cool? Oh. That's and, really cool. uh, oh, we have a question love, here. Where did you awesome. meet each other? So, Henry, we met each other really because helped, we were yeah. both part of this. Yeah, we were both part of this uh, career development program called Astro Artist, which we'll talk about more later. But here is Dimitri. Let's let's introduce him, give him some warm love. He doesn't have an audience to to really <laughs> get excited about, but we're here for him virtually. Everybody in the competition has great hair. In the final they round. Do. They do. Did you have a page turner when you were playing this imposed piece last time? I did. Yeah. yeah uh, the pieces job. were similar. Mine was called um, Butterfly's Dream, and also was sort of impressionistic. Okay. All right. Let's let's give a listen to this piece for the first two to three minutes, and then we'll talk about this afterwards. Okay.
This is bringing up so many memories of trying to meld the sounds and just just knowing that this is the time that we spent seven days learning this foreign piece and actually it's coming into real life now. What do you think about this piece so far, Henry? Uh, Does it remind you of your butterflies no, in the okay. garden? It's similar. I mean, a little bit in the orchestration. I'm looking at the score right now, but um, the I think the butterfly, mine was called Butterfly's Dream, and it had more, um, I think it was more structurally clear. This seems kind of like a, a kind of poem, like that's yeah. just kind of going through. I'd, but the Butterfly's Dream was very clear, like A, B, and then there was like tra traditional kind of cadenza passage, which was nice, you know, as, as mm. not having the piece for that long to have a part where you're just alone and you don't have to be concerned about am I entering correctly or whatever. <laughs> so. What did you feel like it's kind of learning, learning that piece in just seven days? Were you overwhelmed? Were you like, oh, you looked at this quite, this is pretty good. I think I can do this. Or were you like <gasps> anxious? Like, how did it feel for you personally wow. about learning this piece? No, I think it, it was okay. I actually, before I did the competition, had to learn a, a very difficult concerto in 10 days by a living composer. And it was like a four minute, four movement, 30 minute work. So I think that kind of prepared me for this, this process. Absolutely. No, this we have a Jackie question here from... ask, yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Henry. So, you know, the orchestra learns it beforehand with like a rehearsal pianist, I think. And then the, uh, we were given a recording of a read through of the orchestra, but without the piano part, so that we'd have no kind of influence of how it went. But also because, you know, they had just gotten the score, I think at the time of recording, it, I actually didn't use that recording much. I just went mostly by the orchestral score that we were given. Wow. That's that's pretty impressive. I also had a recording I remember, and I I just played it with I played it like it was karaoke. I played over and over and over. But that, but what surprised really? me was that even when I went on stage, it was still so different. So I felt like, oh, that's kind of weird. Oh well. But at that seven days, well, I was, uh, it's 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 yeah. Yeah, go on, Henry. I was just really lucky to have Marin kind of at the helm because she was so clear about everything in the score, like whenever I had an entrance or something with somebody, it was just, I felt like she kind of carried me along in it. Um, and it, it, it like this piece, you know, what I think about this piece is the piano's role is much more integrated into the orchestra than the piece that I played by Claude Ledu. We, you know, there's a much more soloistic aspect, but this is very much like the piano seems to be part of this, fairy garden and the other instruments are too. Exactly. He's playing it in a very similar way, I think, to the first three nights in a very ethereal uh, way. Yesterday was very percussive, which, which I thought, I mean, not one is better than the other, but I thought it was just a different approach to it. This isn't, this is yeah. really cool. Did you, did, did anyone in the, uh, in the competition in your year, did anyone memorize the compulsory piece? One of them did, Alberto Ferro from Italy, memorized it. And I thought that was really impressive. Did you I ever just wouldn't think about memorizing it? In that situation. No way. No, because <laughs> I, I thought, you know, I think when you memorize something, it should be, it should be like really, oh, I really internalized the whole score and I, I really have something to say. And I, I thought, I felt like, for me, that would have been disingenuous to go on stage and be like, well, I can probably get through it, but I actually don't really know what's going on. So I needed the score there. I think I'm very pro score. <laughs> pro score. Let's give a thumbs up to that. I'm a pro scorer as well. I think that's so true because when you start memorizing something, you're more worried about memorizing the notes and not messing up rather than actually bringing out what the music has. Totally. Because you have it for such a mm -hmm. short amount of time. It's not like people are pressuring. You can't expect that much. So Aaron Korea says, uh, says, so do you 
Uh, you both had a recording of the orchestra part for reference during those seven days. That's correct, Aaron Korea. It does seem better, yeah. I don't know if they've always done that, but definitely, I guess, since Henry's time, they did do that. I've heard some other times maybe they did not do that in the past before. I don't know. This part's but cool. We're coming um, with the trills. I like this part. Yeah. This we're notated trills. And... And... Yeah. Let's, let's give our last few minutes attention to just listening to this piece because it's coming close to the end.
Bravo. Bravo. I know that feeling after playing that first piece, it's like, oh, half of it's done. What did you feel after you played this, the, the imposed piece, and then ready for your big second piece? Well, I remember that the audience applauded right away. So I thought, oh, I must have played it OK, you know, because I had no idea. And um, so I felt really good. And then I was just really excited to play the Prokofiev. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I remember after playing the... the... Having the audience. Exactly. Yeah, after I played mine, I remember the audience just was so enthusiastic. I was like, yay, I think I did a good job. And now let's go do Tchaikovsky and make it even better. So, Henry, you chose to play which concerto and why? I chose Prokofiev's second concerto uh, one, on the one hand for practical reasons, because it was a concerto I knew well and had played with orchestra several times before. And I knew that that week before the final, I'd be learning a new piece. So I didn't want to be working on another concerto at the same time. And the other reason was um, that it,
concerto is such a soulful and rhapsodic melody. Henry, how do you think it's going so far? Well, I think one of the challenges right in this opening is that there are these periodic accelerandi and getting that tight with the orchestra is always, you know, can be difficult. I think he's doing a really great job. I'm curious about this second theme. a lot of chamber music with him and the winds and the strings now. Yeah, a lot of dialogue in this theme. And um, that's a lot of the concerto is, is that way. I mean, it's beautifully orchestrated. And I think, you know, for a competition, you have to be sensitive to how much time you're going to have to rehearse with the orchestra. So, sorry, we have to listen to this part. Yeah, like if you play Brahms too, for instance, you ha that's an already an hour long concerto. So you might only have time to read through it in the rehearsal with the orchestra. Um, and this is also a 40 minute concerto with a lot of time changes. So I think whatever you choose to play, you should it should be something you've done with orchestra. So you know what all the spots are to watch out for, you know? Mm -hmm. Would you say this concerto is a really hard one to put together with orchestra? Um, I don't think it's the hardest. I think it's okay, actually. I think you just, you have to know how to signal to the orchestra your and the conductor what your pulse is. And then sometimes you have to let the conductor take over. You know, it's always knowing when is it you who's really setting things and when is it the conductor? Because you don't want to exactly. be making that decision on stage, you know? I agree. It's one of those things I find like Brahms actually tends to be a really, really deceiving concerto to whether that be violin or piano to put together with orchestra because first of all, it's long, but also there's so many subtleties and the, the changes of tempo are so nuanced. Whereas sometimes like Tchaikovsky violin concerto, it's very clear. It's like everybody knows it. They know more or less yeah. if you're going to take it slower or faster. We'll know within a few seconds. So got to be really strategic with how you choose your repertoire for a competition and definitely something right. that you've performed more than, I would say, five times, hopefully. <laughs> I think also, though, it's, what's tough is with these really famous concertos is that everybody has an idea of like a kind of standard interpretation. And sometimes that can be a little limiting you know because if you want to take a tempo a certain way and and they're not used to playing it that way you kind of have to fight a battle there but um i was really impressed with i think his name is tamoki who played brahms too i thought he did yes. a really great job and that is probably i would say one of the most difficult concertos to play let alone in a competition and his he was so uh it was a very intelligent performance. And that's a pretty rare concerto to program course, for your final round too. Well, we have two of them this year and I remember there was one when I did it. Um, I think it does show up. Um, and Lukash, who won the year I did it, played, of course, Rock 3. This is a, one of the build-up passages.
Yeah. So that's kind of the one of the climactic moments before um, this really long cadenza that appears in the first movement. And we'll see which one he cho- chooses. There's, there's two that Rachmaninoff wrote, one that's more scherzando, and the other which is more often played, which has huge chords and um, I think was made especially famous by the movie Shine. But here is the kind of um, quelling of energy before this next thing. I'm noticing that the, the, there's a lot of big chords. Cadenza. I'm noticing that there's a lot of big chords. Do you need particularly large hands to play this particular concerto, or, or is that just a myth? Um. Well, you know, Alicia de la Rocha, Spanish pianist famously had small hands and yet she played this concerto so beautifully. So I don't know. I think having big hands can help with certain things, but might make other things difficult. There's also a lot of intricate passage work in this piece that you need very, you know, skilled acrobatic fingers to pull off. So it really demands, I think, first and foremost, like a, a real imagination for sound. I don't think having small hands means you can't play this. It just might mean you have to be more creative about how you approach some of the these passages. So here, of course, is the beginning of the cadenza. Okay. Listen. So yeah, he clearly chose the more famous cadenza. And, um, you know, one thing I do want to say that maybe our listeners aren't aware of, which is a peculiar thing about the piano competition in particular, is that there's only one instrument that all the competitors play on. And I remember every day it felt like a different instrument, depending on when the technician came, how many people had played on it and um 
some days the action felt super light, some days it felt incredibly heavy. So, you know, when you're playing these really virtuosic uh, pieces, it's not like a traditional concert where you you talk to the technician, you fix every little issue. You, you kind of have to really hope that uh, it, it's going to be feeling nice that day. And I think um, that's one of the extra challenges specifically about the Queen Elizabeth competition, because other competitions have several pianos to choose from. But in this Queen Elizabeth, you get the one Steinway from the Mayana pianos and, and you, you know, it changes every day. Yeah, I can imagine that. That must be, I mean, that for me is such a difficult thing to process because I'm playing on the same instrument for hours, for years. And I can't, like, if I take someone else's instrument, I don't know how to play what I've, what I've been practicing. So, yeah, piano, piano problems. <laughs> yeah, But especially sure. this one in this time. Oh, I think another... Timmy, I was going to say, I think another reason why Rachmaninoff Third Concerto and Prokofiev II are chosen a lot for competitions are because they have these huge cadenzas where the pianists can really show off their soloistic mm -hmm. skills. You know, the first movement of Prokofiev II, half of it is a solo cadenza, you know, right. this famous five minute tour de force. And as we heard here, another um, cadenza composed by Rachmaninoff which, you know, really pulls out all the stops in terms of virtuosity. Absolutely. We have a comment here from Otto House. Sin's performance is more traditional than Redkin's, who we heard yesterday. More power, too. That's his strength, but also his weakness. Interesting. Interesting comment. Hmm. More traditional. Hmm. I didn't oh, hear... Yes, this is the closing of the movement. Kind of a memory of the beginning of the movement. Yeah, I didn't hear Redkin's performance of, of this, but he strikes me as a really interesting musician, very thoughtful from what I've heard. Like it, very thoughtful. Yeah, these little things can be really challenging when you practice a difficult passage like that at your tempo. And then if the orchestra doesn't take that tempo, you know, you have to have the flexibility to adjust right in the moment and it might feel completely different than what you practice. So I think that's another aspect of playing a concerto that, you know, really shows the jury if, if you're ready for the demands of a, a real concert career where you might be playing a different concerto every night in a week, you know? Absolutely. So here we finished the first movement and the second movement is nice because the pianist gets a long break at the beginning of the movement with this gorgeous uh, kind of lamenting uh, writing in the orchestra. Yeah, yeah, let's, let's give this a lesson.
beautiful, this opening. We do have a comment from Sean's Choice and a question. How do you practice maintaining focus? I'd be so exhausted after that cadenza. I mean, Henry, mm -hmm. I mean, you're playing so many notes at once. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, uh, I don't know if there's a way to practice it except to just do it. And you really, with these kind of concertos, you really have to learn physically how you feel through the piece. You know, we really live the, the piece. And so the first time you might play it, it might be a real struggle after this cadenza, but then the next time you kind of understand more the path of the piece and what you need to save for and where you're going to be tired. And, and I, I really think that's why when you go to a competition like this, you use, you should program a concerto that you've played before. So you, you're not experiencing those things for the first time in such a, you know, high energy environment like the Queen Elizabeth. Okay. He's coming in. I don't know, are there any vi violin concertos with huge cadenzas? I mean, there's the Brahms, of course, and Beethoven, but it's, it's different. That's I why I would say, I think that's why I would say Sibelius, Tchaikovsky, are the sure. bread and butter for competition pieces because it is a long concerto for violin standards. I mean, for you, it's probably standard because Tchaikovsky is about almost 30, 35 minutes. Sibelius is about 30, 35. There is a huge cadenza in both of the first movements uh, for violin standards, at least. It takes up at least three to four minutes. So that's why I think they're becoming such good competition pieces because it does explore so many abilities and skills of the violin to communicate to the audience. Whereas something like, I'm trying to think of another concerto. That's why I think Saint-Saëns concerto number three, even though it's a beautiful piece, it doesn't really always do so well. Um, I would say Brahms and Beethoven are also great because they do have big cadenzas, but I would say it's kind of a toss up. It's kind of a, it's a toss up a coin because I think everybody has such polarizing opinions of Beethoven and Brahms, and also it is such a delicate orchestration that you really need a lot of rehearsal time. And when you're under stress and all that, that can't always be executed properly. So with Brahms and Beethoven concerto for violin, I think that's like, if you do a really amazing job, it trumps anything else that's programmed, but it can also has a huge amount of risk. So my favorite part of this movement is, you know, it kind of oscillates between this major tender theme and then this more stormy minor theme. And in the middle, there's this huge buildup, which we should take time to listen to, to just like this absolute, like, it's like standing on top of a mountain and just, it's, it's so, you know, it's grandiose and beautiful. And that's going to be coming up. Um, but each variation kind of of the theme, he makes it more complicated, more complicated. And then it, it, all this tension builds up to this opening of these huge chords in the piano. And again, this dissipates into a kind of scherzo um, with lots of repeated notes and very Scarlatti-esque writing in the piano.
yeah, so it seems to me like Dimitri is really a, a kind of a fiery player, you know, where some people might have opted to take this more luxuriating and the spaciousness of it. He really is um, kind of pushing, pushing forward. Yeah, it's such a powerful moment because it just feels like it just built from the ground up. Yeah. So when did you learn this, this piece, Henry? This is kind of stuff. When did yeah, you learn this I'll, piece? I learned it. Yeah, I actually uh, came, was asked to play Rock 3 in 2018. And um, so I learned it for that. And I'm going to be playing it next season, actually three times in Hartford, Connecticut. So I'm really looking forward to having the chance to try it again with orchestra. I think, you know, there are so many interpretations of this piece and everybody kind of has to find their own way with it. Yeah. So this is the, uh, there's going to be a recalling of the beginning of this movement and then it's an ataka into the third movement immediately. Okay which we'll hear, there's this kind of crazy cadenza. And then the third movement is, is probably the most brilliantly conceived for the piano. It's like a wild tarantella. Wow. Okay, we'll, we'll look out for that. Just one comment from Otter House 22. Sin is more stable than Redkin. Yesterday's performance, more, more coherent. Doubted a bit, but I think the Palmar is uh, so far gone. Oh, to Dimitri. Okay, so yeah, I think he means the, the you know the he's saying like the the winner the winning you know whatever mm -hmm. goes to Dimitri. I I I didn't watch Redkin, but um this is you know he's definitely going for things in this performance. Sometimes more successfully than others. It's always a risk, you know, with such virtuosic music if you just go with your fire, you might drop out some notes and it's always maintaining that balance. Exactly. So speaking about your Rachmaninoff concertos in Hartford is, I mean, this is kind of opening a can of worms, but I do have a question that I want to ask you about how has the COVID-19 pandemic really affected your performing schedule? Are you looking towards now going forward into rebooking everything and is there anything in particular and specific that you're super looking forward to in the next year that's hopefully going to go through? Yeah, let's talk about it after this transition. Okay. To the third movement. So you can you can see, especially um, with the great views you have here of his hands, this this movement is a true finger buster, um, yeah. and it's it moves incredibly fast. Um, so in terms of, sorry, this is so exciting. I have to listen. Yeah, yeah, you have to listen to this first. Yeah.
So Timmy, you talked about having big hands. This is definitely a passage where having larger hands helps because the left hand, as you see, it's this cord, cord, and always jumping. It's really, really tough. And I think for Rachmaninoff, he probably just could play, you know, all in one, one motion without having mm. to move the hand position. Right. Um, we we all we were asking about um. Oh, just one one oh, thing yeah, before I want to ask you, just uh, just to stick on that. So as pianists, you know, not everybody has large hands, but some people can stretch a ridiculous amount. Is that something that you 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 have to actually practice stretching, or does it just come as you play more and more and more? Yeah, I actually I stretched on the piano when I was a kid. My teacher used to have me do like these kind of stretches against the instrument to make sure between oh. the fingers I had. A, so I actually have really flexible hands now. Like, can kind of do weird things with my hands. Oh my gosh! Yeah, this is insane. I mean, I. So this is the. Uh, yeah, this is the end of the, the first kind of, A section, and there's this. You know, E flat major becomes a very important key in the whole scheme of this concerto, and. The entire middle section here is um, in E flat major. So this is a modulation and things kind of calm down. And then we also cycle through a lot of the themes that we've heard in the concerto in this middle section. Julie Ju 538 says, I was wondering about the stretching. Do you need to train your hands to be so fast? Henry? Yeah, you have to pra to play this, you know, this fast, you really need to practice super slowly. And we know that Rachmaninoff was that kind of practicer. Like, there's a famous story that outside of his apartment in New York, you could walk by and he'd be at the Ex, you know, exposition of a Beethoven sonata and you'd go walk in the park for a couple hours and come back and he'd have just gotten to the development. So he practiced famously very, very, very slowly to really understand exactly how everything moves and how all the notes work together. Um, and I think I'll, another thing is it's not just about under, moving your fingers that fast. It's about understanding how how your fingers group into larger units, you know, in your arm and your your whole mechanism. But this, you know, there's trillions, of, <laughs> a million notes in this concerto. Oh, so man, bravo to you, Dimitri. I think, I, I wonder what the experience must be like without the audience, if, if it makes them more nervous or less nervous. I, I'd be curious to know. We should ask him that later. We should ask him that later for sure. This is one of my favorite passages. The harmonies are so, so great. Just want to see a quick note. We're on a record amount of viewers right now. Yeah. He goes all over the place harmonically, only to come back to E flat major. So now the flutes have the material that began the B section in the piano. And now in the winds. So we have a comment here. I mean, this is for me actually, come on 300. We're, we're actually having a record. Oh, we're over, we're over 300 now. 306 viewers on Twitch at one time. Nice. So here comes the first theme of the piece in the cello.
and it's going to slide into the second theme. And then, to me, there's probably one of the greatest passages in any piano concerto after that, where the piano is just playing a, like 30 second notes for two pages and the page is completely black on the score. And it's just like, for me, one of the most exciting passages to play in this concerto. And it's like this huge explosion of sound and color. And it comes after this um, duet of the second theme from the first movement. Okay, let's take a listen. Yeah. Interesting comment from Otterhouse22, bingo, but in the meantime, is Sin getting a bit sloppy or did I mishear that? Here it comes. So that passage, when you perform it, is, is it feels like you're surfing because you're playing all this stuff in super high register while the orchestra is just supporting you with these amazing harmonies underneath. Mm -hmm. Now this is probably like the most distilled moment in the whole piece. It's just simple chords in the piano. Maybe a little nostalgic even. You know, it's the last moment in E flat major. And then we're going to go back to the fireworks that started this movement. But um, in terms of Otter's comment, twenty-two. I yeah. would, I I would say you know, in the if I were on the jury, I'm not necessarily looking for, you know, how perfectly clean it is because I think any of these pianists, given the right experiences with these concertos, would be able to deliver you know, no perfect. I'm more interested in where their mind is at with the interpretation of it, because maybe, you know, we don't know how many times he's played this with orchestra, but if this is, you know, one of the first few times, you know, it takes just the experience, I think, playing it a couple of times, and then you're very comfortable with all the challenges. But he's clearly capable of anything at the piano, you know, so a few wrong notes is, is no big deal as long as he's saying something, which I think he, he continues to do in this piece. Could you guide us? What is it like to play a concerto for the first time with orchestra? For those of us that don't know exactly what that feeling is. Um, it's pretty scary, I think, because you're, you're kind of learned, you do everything you can to prepare and to, to learn how it feels with the orchestra, but nothing prepares you the way of like actually being there with living bodies and seeing how certain passages aren't, are, are different from recordings. You know, some things might be slower, some things might be faster. So you're kind of learning how the piece breathes and it's exciting, but also scary. Um, but then as you get to know it better, and I, I mentioned this earlier, like the kind of physical learning of the piece, you know, you, you, it's like learning, um, it's like learning a, a, a big Shakespearean role or like a big central role in a play. And you have to kind of understand how it breathes and moves and how the structure works. And that takes a couple times, but I think it's always exciting, you know, and I think it's exciting to watch young pianists going through this process and like watching their minds um, develop an interpretation and, and, understand better who they are as pianists and that's what we get to see in in something like queen elizabeth competition mm -hmm. so we're almost at the end of this concerto why don't we just give our full attention to his performance
on, chat. Come on, viewers. Wahoo. Let's clap for him virtually. That was a huge accomplishment. Bravo. <laughs> Elbow bump. It's so, it's so different without the audience. You know, because usually I that concerto finishes and there's a whole roar of the whole audience. But yeah, exactly. you did great. Yeah, wow, what a what an accomplishment. Henry, what did you feel like after you got off stage at last note? We saw you like you hugging Marin. Did you feel like a whole yeah. weight has been lifted off you or did you just feel like that was easy or that was hard or whatever? What did you feel like? Oh, I felt I felt so relieved. I was so excited to just be kind of out of the grips of this competition. And I'm I'm sure Dimitri's going to feel that too. It's 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 the not just that concerto. It's you've been doing this for almost a month of waiting, of practicing, of worrying. So to kind of have that pressure be gone and, you know, go out and get some good Belgian beer is really fun. <laughs> Which night did you play on? <laughs> I was on the last night, I think. I oh, think I was so you actually had a really... Second. Yeah, I was the last night. Okay. Wow. Okay, that's always, I mean, there, I think there's a statistics that the Queen Elizabeth competition has, and they're like generally, I mean, we know this as musicians, but like fifth and uh, like near the end of the competition, they tend to do the best in terms of result mm -hmm. rankings. I don't know if that has any truth to yeah. it. Maybe that's just coincidental, but I know on my end, I always prefer near to play near the end. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you're fresher in the memory. Um, and I think yeah. you probably are, it's helpful to be towards the end because of the commission piece, because you, you spent a bunch of time listening to the other competitors practice it. So that helps you learn it. Whereas if you're the first one, you're really coming at it totally fresh. Um, yeah, but I think, you know, we're going to talk to uh, Dimitri soon and he must just feel so relieved. I mean, also, also yeah. after being, you know, kind of trapped in the Chappelle for seven weeks, you're just happy to be kind of free, you know? Exactly. Yeah, I can imagine. I, I really do wonder what the Chappelle felt like this year, because in some ways, I don't think it's as different as what we've been living through, because we've been going through quarantine over the past year and a couple months now. And I mean, it just feels like an extension of quarantine at this point, just no internet and cell phone. Do you remember when you went into the Chappelle? Did you feel like it was really yeah. hard to not have your cell phone and your and, and wireless internet and to be removed from society almost? No, it was great. And I was actually at the Chappelle this past January to record an album with Christine Lee. And um, it was such a different experience being there outside of the competition. But like, when you go there during the competition, it's a really special experience. I mean, it's is something I think we all dream of when we enter the competition. And yeah, I was just so happy to be there. And, and I made really good friends with the other finalists. So I didn't need my phone to distract me. It looks like we have a, a good question about this from Grace Piano. Does the size of the orchestra have an influence on pianist's approach of playing as opposed to classical concertos, Mozart, where you have a smaller orchestra? I think absolutely. Um, as I was saying, like in Brahmanov, you know, he's coming at the same time, you know, coming off of Wagner and at the same time as Mahler, where the orchestra's growing, kind of this getting to its full capacity of sound. So the pianist, in when you're playing Prokofiev, when you're playing um, Rachmaninoff, you really have to be playing from your entire body, where in Mozart concerto, it's a different texture and the pianos were different even in Mozart's time. So you're playing with much more finesse and and um, those elements do show up in these concertos, but for these huge moments, you have to play like you are seven feet tall and the the piano is like being consumed by your entire being. Also to, to, totally to match the energy and sound of that orchestra, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, it's such a different uh, type of physical 
a reaction that your body has to cope with when you're playing something by Mozart and something by Tchaikovsky, Shostakovich for the violin part. You really have to put your feet ground, uh, your your feet on the ground. Yeah. So speaking of that, uh, Henry, you, you mentioned earlier that you are going to play Rachmaninoff Third Concerto with Hartford Symphony in Connecticut next season. Is it next season or was it this season? I mean, the season's almost yeah, done. Yeah, so next, next April. Next April. What is a couple of performances you're really looking forward to next year? Well, I'm really excited to come uh, back to the Chapelle to play with Christine for our album. I'm excited. Um, I have some concerts out in California in March, and I'm just excited to be in Southern California for two weeks. It's going to be really nice. And of course, to play Rachmaninoff again. Um, and recently I've returned to live performing and um, it's really, you know, it's like, a, it feels like it was a lifetime ago that I was traveling for concerts. And so to be back doing that feels really good. And um, I really enjoy being on stage in front of people. I, I think it, you know, I'm just so excited to have that, those experiences again. Um, and I hope the whole world can get, vaccinated so we can just do that again you know yeah it's gonna be really exciting to, to just be on the road again and just to start collaborating with orchestras it's been a long 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 year of silence but we have ian bernstein who is on the jury of the queen elizabeth piano competition to join with us hi ian how are you hi guys can you hear me okay oh, hi we can hear you very well yes. good Great where to see you, you. Where are you calling in from? Great to see you as well. Where are you calling from? The east end of uh, lovely London town. <laughs> nice. Can you please introduce yourself to all everyone on, on the chat here? Um, I mean, we know oh who God. you are, but we've got over we've got a record amount of uh, viewers right now. We've got almost oh, okay. more than four hundred, almost four hundred people watching us all at once right now, which is a record wow, viewership. Awesome. But please introduce yourself. Okay, so I'm a pianist and I'm mostly what we call a collaborative pianist. I work with singers and instrumentalists and I avoid playing Rachmaninoff Third Concerto as much as possible. And it has been my pleasure and honor to serve on the Queen Elizabeth jury, both for pianists and singers. I was on the jury uh, when Henry played, so I hope he's not sticking pins in voodoo dolls of me. And uh, uh, <laughs> I did not receive his credit card details at any point. And uh, so what can I tell you? I do, I do all sorts of, uh, I do some uh, other things um, that don't involve playing the piano. I, I, I do some writing and I do some broadcasting. I, I had a show for some years on BBC Radio 3. And yeah, I'm just a bit of a musical tart, really. I mean, this is super interesting. Um, I mean, thanks for introducing yourself. But also, you're the first jury member or former jury member that has joined us on our show. And we're wondering, what is it like with your perspective to be on the jury of this type of competition? Well, I've been in various juries and I have to say the Queen Elizabeth jury experience is unlike any other because it's so long uh, and, and it, it just spans such a sort of epic Wagnerian timescale. So you have to go into a, a, a kind of Mahler symphony mode of listening and it's a lot of listening and a lot of concentrating and it's very bizarre because um you're put on you're put on your kind of word of honor that you're, you're not going to discuss everyone all the playing with your colleagues and so you have endless meals with all these other pianists and you talk about everything except the one thing you really want to talk about which is what did you think of that henry guy what was timothy like did you like did you like his list how was the Beethoven? You know, and for the most part, for the most part, people are, are very honourable about that and don't discuss it, uh, which is good because um, because that's the way it should be, and, and wants it to be fair and uh, and all that. But it's it's I, I mean it's it's a wonderful experience. It's very enriching, um, and I tell you, it's a lot easier to sit there and listen than it is to sit there and play. I can tell you that much for free. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't know. Does that paint a picture? It's very uh, and I mean, absolutely. I'll tell you. I'll tell you one thing. I found really difficult is doing the feedback sessions with c contestants who have been eliminated. 
Mm. And uh, I, 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 I've done that to the max both times I've been there. Um, some jury members aren't comfortable doing it and duck out of it, and that's fine. Everyone has to make their own choices. Um, I, I think it's part of the job and part of what you should do. But that is, that is really quite tough because no one wants to get kicked out. It's a horrible experience. I've been there. It, it, and you can give, I hope, in some cases, useful feedback. And there are several, many occasions where I'm sitting there saying, I thought you played beautifully. I put you through. I voted for you. What can I tell you? And that's, I don't think that makes anything, anyone feel any better in the long run. But what can you do? So you try and be constructive. You try and give people things to work on or take away so that it's not just a bitter pill to swallow and, and you try and say it really doesn't matter, which in the long run, actually, I have to say it doesn't. I, and that might be heretical as here we are on a competition, website and competitions. But in the end of the day, it's tomorrow's chip paper, as we say in Britain, you know. <laughs> People, find, there, are many, there are many different ways to careers and, uh, and the world is full of um, career winners who, who haven't gone on to make enduring careers and vice versa. So, I mean, it, it, it's not to say there isn't huge value in it. Of course there is. But, um, the, you know, it's very important for people to go into these competitions with their eyes open, with realistic expectations, and to know why they're doing it and what they're hoping to get out of it. That's my philosophy. Wow, that's that's such a thorough answer. I mean, that's that means so much. I think, especially the idea of I think a lot of people say you must win a competition in order to have a successful career. And I myself am realizing that that definition, that path, is changing, especially with all the new ways of communicating with an audience in the twenty first century. Sure. I think that changed about thirty years ago, actually. Well, I, actually, I think it's never been true. There have always been different ways of getting careers, but since you know. About 30, 40 years ago, the number of major competitions absolutely ballooned, proliferated. And, and in a way that, that um, devalues the currency a little. Because, you know, you know the jokes about you can walk, walk down Fifth Avenue in New York and, and see you know, the stickers saying, for, for first prize Tchaikovsky, winner gives violin lessons, whatever. You know, uh, it, it's a silly joke, but there's, there's an element of truth to it. And um, there, there are all sorts of different ways. I mean, also, there are different forms of success. There are different forms of musical happiness. And I mean, I, I, I've found a niche and a, a kind of combination of musical activities that I enjoy and uh, that suit me. And I, I, in my old age, I've worked out that I'm a bit of a multitasker. And I, I'm happiest not just playing the piano. I have years where I, I have only played the piano and it doesn't really make me happy particularly and I don't enjoy spending huge amounts of my life in airports and hotel rooms and and one of the one of the challenges of the competition system is that it it sort of implies that success is being a concerto soloist going around the world playing with major orchestras the whole time and that suits some people but you know what not very many and if you're going to sign up for that lifestyle, you better be ready for it, and pianistically, emotionally, personally. If you have a partner, if you have a wife or a husband, you know, wave them goodbye. See you at the airport, baby. You know, it's very hard. It's very hard to. It's very hard to sustain a normal family life if you're really riding that particular roller coaster. And you know, it's it's really not for everybody. So, I, I think. And actually, doing, co do, doing competitions and getting kicked out was, for me, a salutary experience of showing me that that was God's way of telling me to look at different repertoire. And so that story has a happy ending. So what can I tell you? Wow, there's so many, so many truths that you're just speaking about right now. It's so true. I mean, I know that so many of my colleagues who have gotten an international career where they're touring basically 300 days out of the year, you know, you barely have time to form any personal relationships and it's sure. extremely stressful. I mean, it's, it's very glamorous on the outside, but on the inside, it's, it's, it's pretty torturous sometimes to be delayed on a flight and then to finally are playing a concerto that you haven't touched for like three weeks and you have sure. two days to prepare. You haven't been able to practice. It's very stressful. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And absolutely, I, I totally agree with you. But, you know, having an irregular career sometimes equates irregular personal life as well. You can't have it both ways, right? In order to balance, you've got to somewhat understand that you can't have everything 
uh, all at once. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for sharing that with the audience. Henry, I'm gonna let you ask questions to Ian because you guys know each other better and uh, if there's any loose ends that you wanna <laughs> make up now. <laughs> oh, I mean, I can, I, I think we may have met at the very last day I of the competition, think, but I, as actually, said, no, I don't, I don't think, think we it ever met. Because I, I, no, we, I had to run away. I didn't do the meet and greet with the, the laureates because I had to, I had a concert, I had to run away and, um, the, okay. The, well, that's what I thought, but I didn't want to be so, rude. Yeah. No, 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 no. We yeah. didn't meet. No, yeah. I, and say, and then say, we never met. And then you say, yeah, we did. Don't you remember? Oh, um, no, 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 we but, didn't. I can tell you, you know, did. as, so, yeah. but later, as congratulations. Said, you know, we're competitors in tour. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. You know, we, but we never, that tells you something about the competition. We never talked. Um, I don't have, I don't have any questions. I think everything he said is awesome. And I think for young musicians who are thinking about doing these competitions, yeah, to not just think about, oh, once I get the prize, then it's, you know, everything's set and that I'm just on a roller coaster track and it will tell me where to go. You have to think like, what do you want beyond that? Because it's not just about the prize, as you said, you know, what do you want out of your life? What kind of musical life do you want? What's truly satisfying for you? And I think one of the risks um, of being a young classical musician is that all of your energy is focused around ex uh, modes of external validation, you know, whether it's a competition prize or somebody telling you you're good. And um, it's, if you go into that route, you know, you can get first prize in every competition and still feel like you need more of that. So to just follow what brings you joy and in music and in your life and just keep doing that and and finding a way to balance music into that i think is, is the the way forward and a competition is a great way to meet people it's a great way to test your repertoire to push yourself but i've been on both sides of um you know winning and losing and neither one is like um you know winning does isn't the answer to everything yeah Oh yeah, this this question about your headphones is is very apt. I mean, his background is is very um, Wes Anderson esque, I would say. <laughs> we all got very interesting backgrounds today. I'm very impressed. This is the best background compilation so far. Good, good. Uh, so the simple answer to Yoop Zuzu is uh, no. I these these are cheap and cheerful headphones, and that's I could find. And I, I'd love to say I, I bought them to match my paint color, but I didn't. But it's adorable of you to notice. Thank you. Did you use these headphones when you were running your show at BBC Three? Certainly not. No, they had professional ones in there. <laughs> Can you tell us more? What, what were you exactly? Uh, what kind of show did you present on uh, C, uh, BBC Radio Three? Oh well, I did. I, I, I've had uh, I've had two different shows on a regular basis. Uh, I don't do any of them anymore. But I I had a show called Voices, which was about singers and song repertoire, and famous singers profiled and all that, and some interview programs and some thematic compilations where we'd have all songs about sleep or about soldiers or about animals, whatever. And then later on, I did the Sunday morning program um, on Radio Three between 10 and 12 um, to, you know, give people nice things to listen to while they peeled their potatoes or drank their coffee. And now I do some, uh, <laughs> the thing I do most regularly there is a program called Record Review, where uh, I, I try not to review the records of my friends and colleagues for very obvious reasons, but uh, they, they've got a very interesting uh, thread there called Building a Library. Where they give you, um, where they give you a, a, a piece, or you discuss with them what piece you want to do, and you have to uh, listen to lots of different versions, and then choose uh, your favorite from that, and explain why. And I've been doing that for some years now, and that's really interesting. That's a really interesting job to do because it makes you, it makes you really evaluate what, uh, you know, um, what what your criteria are in performance and why why you like Richter more than Argerich or whatever in if it's piano repertoire and, you know all, all different stuff so that that's a, that's a very nice that's a very nice like, kind of side shoot the main thrust do you have a twitch channel no i'm too <laughs> old to have a twitch channel timothy i i i'm bald i can't possibly have a twitch channel 
I just I'd watch you. You should tell you. I'm, I'm, I'm old school. I didn't know about Twitch before today. I have to tell you before I signed up to this thing. So uh, no, I'm 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 uh, analog, not digital. I have to tell you that's not strictly true, but um, uh, the simple answer is no. Uh, but thank you for asking. Well, I mean, Twitch, should I have a Twitch? Uh, well, what, should I have a Twitch channel? What would I do in a Twitch channel? You can have your own show. I mean, Twitch is the next hottest platform for streaming. I mean, right now we're having almost 450 viewers all at once. This is like amazing for a classical music channel. And um, it's it's really incredible because I think it's it's a, a platform dedicated for streaming and very interactive. Uh, we just have one question from Kawa BXL. Don't you think the teacher should be the first to keep the students' feet on the ground before going on competitions? Oh, this is an interesting competition. I'll let you mm. both fight this out. Mm. Henry, do you want to go first on that one? Well, I think that's tricky because, you know, not every teacher is a beacon of morality or, or uh, <laughs> I hate to say this, but, you know, you have to be able to assess what, what your teacher's motives are too, you know? And um, I think certainly a teacher can can be useful if you if you trust this person and, and they've been really good with you. If they say you're not ready, maybe next one, then that's a good feedback. But sometimes it depends, you know, it really depends on the teacher. I'm not, I, I, sure. I can't say that there's that. one answer to that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's a good way of putting it. I think you could also argue that if your teacher's opinion is so crucial to you, you aren't really ready to be doing competitions. I think for certainly major competitions like the one we're involved with now, uh, if, unless, unless you are ready for the outside world, you shouldn't be doing it, unless it's simply to gain experience. But if that is your situation, then, then competition has to be dangerous because you can either have a negative experience, you can feel bad about your playing, or you can be told mean things. And so I think, I, I think there's really, for major competitions, don't, don't enter until you're ready is the, the big mantra. Yeah. But um, can I tell you a little? Uh, yeah. You have... Yes, yes. Go yeah, on. Please. I was just going to tell you a little, a, a little story, uh, uh, perhaps indiscreetly, uh, naming no names. So I was involved with the vocal competition that I was actually covering for the BBC. I was there as a commentator. And there was, uh, there was one round. It, 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 the situation was five singers sing each evening and a winner in each evening is declared and then there's a final later. And so in this one particular evening, there were five singers. They were, it's a very high standard. They're all very good. And there was a wonderful Russian baritone who, who had a big CV, big resume. He'd won lots of competitions. He already had a major career. He sang absolutely beautifully, but the jury chose someone else for that night. So the winner was some soprano or something. And I was standing in the lobby um, of the bar with some colleagues and we we're just having a drink and a chat and this boy appears with his shall we say mentor maybe rather than teacher a formidable Russian woman and they have a few words in Russian and he starts crying and this guy's in his late 20s or something and uh, he starts crying and this is very upsetting this boy was really upset and then he sort of went away and other people shoulders and took him to get a drink and uh, this all happened in Russian and few words were exchanged and so one of my colleagues said to the mentor um, what was that about uh, what went wrong there and uh, and she answered he said how did I do and I said you lost oh my god so my goodness and that was the end of the conversation so you know, different national schools have different ways of looking at these things. And the stakes can be very high, you know? And, you know, there's situations like, like you know, and I'm sure I don't have to tell you guys that in Korea you can be exempt military service if you, if you uh, win first prize in a very short list of very major competitions. And, uh, my goodness, there's, there's an incentive to enter a competition. I mean, that can be literally life-changing. So if, when you're doing the truly international major competitions, there are all sorts of different reasons, different agendas for people entering and different, different, the stakes are, the stakes are high. I studied in Eastern Europe at, at a time before you guys were born, but um, at, at a time when um, in the communist era, uh, having a musical career 
was not seen as something weird, fringe, freaky, and arty-farty as it is in my country at the moment. It was seen as a way to get a, a, a passport, to earn foreign, hard currency, foreign currency, and really make an impact. And so I went from the Royal Academy in London to the Chopin Academy in Warsaw, and the atmosphere was completely different because people worked with an entirely different intensity because it was a way out of a communist lifestyle into a Western lifestyle. And so if you didn't have your ass in a piano stool at eight in the morning when the school opened, you weren't going to get one for the rest of the day because people really, practice was not regarded as something kind of, you know, frilly. It was a means to an end. And uh, that was, you know, and there's a legacy of that to this day, I think. There is. That's, yeah, that's for sure. really a incredible insight. Um, yeah, we have to go now because Dimitri is going to join us for an interview now. But thank you so much for your insight. It was truly, I mean, I, I learned great. so much just in this past 20 minutes. So have a nice night and thank you so much. We'll see you soon. Thank you. And I look forward to hearing both of you play. Yeah, great to see yeah. you. All right, so Dimitri's going to join us. Dimitri, congratulations. Yeah. Bravo. Hello. Thank you. Bravo. Thank you. Thank you. Bravo. Wow. Thank you so much for joining us on Twitch tonight. How do you feel Thank about you. your performance, first of all? Mm, I'm just happy to be here. So this wonderful hall and on this great stage, we play with this great orchestra and play this wonderful concerto. Yeah, just happy and tired a little. <laughs> yeah, it was so exciting to watch and to hear you. And I, th I thought you did a great job with um, the, com the commission piece. Thank you. And thank you. Are you happy to be out of the Chapelle? How was your experience? Uh, experience was it was great time. We uh, I can concentrate just on music and very, very tasty meal and very beautiful nature around and just, yeah. But I'm also happy to exit the chapel because, um, yeah, I want mm. to see my host family again <laughs> and walking yeah. around and yeah, I want to see my phone again, <laughs> mobile oh, phone. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did you get your to cell phone my yet? Parents. No, 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 I don't have right now. Not yet. Ah, yeah. You're going to get it soon. <laughs> we have a question here from one of our viewers. It says, why did you yeah. choose Rachmaninoff's third concerto? Uh, it's very easy. It's my f very favorite piano concerto from piano. Yeah, because I like it and I I feel it, it's, it's very close to me. And yeah, I, I can understand this music really well, I think. I feel like that. It's, I love this concerto. It's my favorite. Can I ask it, how many times have you performed this or, or had an experience with, with the orchestra in this, in this specific concerto? It was the third time in my life I performed this concerto. Yeah. yeah. And, and yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah, we have a question for oh, you. We were um, just, that we, we wanted yeah. to ask you. It's did you feel playing without an audience was more difficult or easier? Oof. I, I I played you know first round without audience, semi final without audience. But for me, jury members are also audience, and I try to concentrate just on music and don't think about this. Uh, difficult situation, I understand, but it's it's a little bit sad because it's very beautiful hall, but empty. Uh, yeah, I I can just play music. Yeah, Dimitri, are you thinking about mm. all the people watching online what you're playing, and the cameras and all that? No, no, no. I just I just saw a keyboard <laughs> and no yeah. one around me. Yeah. Yeah. Well it was really it's, it's always a, such an exciting it's always amazing. Thank you very much. I wanna I can I ask another question? Just I mean yeah, yeah. you know, this is such a long competition. And I remember when I was finished I just felt 
so relieved because you are you're waiting to play so much. So do you feel yeah. that now, or are you nervous yeah, for the I results, exactly, or are you just exactly happy experience. that you made it all the way through? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. This feeling, yeah. I'm really happy and really tired, and yeah, it's finished. <laughs> Do you, That's, have, uh, how, yeah. do you have a plan to celebrate? Oh, uh, maybe a little, but yeah, I should. I, but yeah. I must prepare another concert, concert for laureate's concert. It's uh, work continue, <laughs> yeah. never stop. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, get some rest. But we have one question from a viewer to, to ask yeah. you because you played the Rachmaninoff Third and also the night before Sergey Redkin played. The question yeah. is, did hearing him play in the Chapelle, just uh, just knowing that he was playing, did that influence you in any way? No, no, no. I don't have possibility to listen because I don't have laptop, telephone, and and rooms are isolated. We don't hear each other. It's mm -hmm. impossible. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amazing. Well, well, thank you so much for joining some with us. And, yeah. yeah. Thank you very Get much. Get some rest. And congratulations. And, uh, Congrats. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Bravo. Bravo. Yes. Yeah. Have some ice cream. <laughs> yeah. No okay. beer. He needs beer. <laughs> beer, Belgian fries. Oh, no. oh, I love the Belgian fries with the mayonnaise. It's so good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I missed that. That was What was your favorite Belgian part. food? <laughs> the competition. Um, Wow, that's hard to answer because there was so much good food. But uh, my um, my host used to go to the butcher and get these like, I don't know how you call it. There's like these meat, different kind of like meat salads that we would have for breakfast. That was really good. And I loved the beer and of course the French fries. And um, no, food in Belgium is great. I don't think yeah, I had one bad true. meal there. That's true. I mean, the food quality, the quality of food, I find it really, really good. Like everything, even just a freaking strawberry was so good, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, and then yeah, I remember the Belgian waffles. Oh my goodness, the the whipped cream. Uh, I want to go. Back. Let's go, Henry. And the chocolate, chocolate too. Let's go. We should go. Yeah. We should go. We're coming. We should play together again. <laughs> We're coming. We're coming. So yeah. I just want to thank everybody and Henry especially. Thank you so much for joining me today in this conversation. This is our record viewers. We have over 500 people watching us at the same time right now. And I think that's that's really incredible. This is It's all you guys that are in the chat section that's making this possible. So, And Henry, thank you so much again for joining us. Can you share with the audience where we can find you and connect with you online? Yeah, um, I'm really active on Instagram, and it's just Henry Kramer Piano is my account. So that's where you can keep up with all my musical activities. Awesome. Uh, and you have your own website as, too, as well, right? So we can contact you directly if you want a personal message. <laughs> HenryKramerPiano.com. It's all Henry awesome. Kramer Piano. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, everybody loves you. I'm looking at the chat right now, and they're like, "We love you, Henry. We love you, Henry." That's awesome. Uh, so thanks, guys. <laughs> it was fun. Yeah. Thanks for uh, we have fun. helping us. <laughs> we had thanks for. I mean, you you gave such great commentary. I mean, you really brought me through. I'm learning. I learned so so much about the piece today as well. And you know, uh, Henry is also a professor right now, and just an amazing artist in in all forms. So, thank you. Tomorrow, we're going to be joined by David Fung. Uh, it's going to be the big day because it's right before the proclamation, and we're going to find out about the results of who's being ranked where. So it's a heart-stopping moment. But we're going to meet here tomorrow again at 8 p.m. Uh, Brussels time, 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern uh, Standard Time in, in America. Any questions you might have, please keep them and, and ask them right away tomorrow. We'd love to uh, you know, celebrate this last Day with you tomorrow and really appreciate you joining me on this journey over the past uh, five days so far so thank you so much and we'll see you all tomorrow we're gonna raid all of you all 500 of you to violin cat all right let's see how this all goes let's see what the response is thank you good night good night